Welcome to Money Matters TV. My name is Paul Mitchell. I'm a commercial banker. My co-host this evening is Jane Scacchetti. Jane, Thank welcome. You. Good to Thank see you. Good to be here. We'll be meeting our featured guest a little later, Mickey yes. McLaughlin of uh, YouGo. I'm excited to hear about Go that. Stations. It very interesting yeah. concept. Yeah. Very interesting concept. So Jane, you're in the accounting field for Scacchetti and Drucker and Scacchetti. Right. You've got a partner and a whole bunch of employees, I understand. I have a bunch of partners and a bunch of employees. We have about 70 people in Center City. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that make you what, a, like a large regional firm? So we only do tax. So mm -hmm. when you consider the fact that we don't do assurance services like audits and reviews, hmm. um, it probably makes us as large as most of the national tax departments and national accounting firms. But all we do is tax advice, tax preparation, tax compliance. Um, but our focus is on taxation. We think that mm -hmm. if you focus on tax, you could be the best business advisor because tax is a business strategy. Which sure, is sure. A tagline we had adopted many years later, but it was our initial impetus. We were the firm that was Laventhal and Horwath. We oh, were yeah, the tax remember them? Sure, of sure. And, Horwath, and we thought that um, we could take and and what was needed was for someone to focus only on tax mm -hmm. and not have that lens of independence required by an audit. Right. So many times we work side by side with other accounting firms that are doing the assurance side mm -hmm. and we do the tax side. Excellent, excellent. Well, I deal with you know, small and medium-sized businesses yeah, tell me and about certain, that. certain that's a real big uh, issue for them uh, yeah. because the, what the tax code is like that and just like uh, any profession, they're uh, you know, tax accountants and they're commercial bankers and they're doctors and, and um, lawyers and um, entrepreneurs and they're all all different stripes, good, you bad, know, and the ugly. We have found too the banks are more than willing now to accept tax-based financial mm -hmm. statements or tax returns because they understand that that taxes really talk about cash flow. Right. And I would assume with banking that's a big part of what you're looking at when you're looking at the viability of, of Well, not only that, it's the credibility. I mean, you sign a tax return, a business signs a tax return. Some individuals are signing as really individuals even when right. they sign their, their company's tax return. That means they've got to be telling the truth. Right, <laughs> right. or they have bigger problems. <laughs> they have bigger problems. Tell me about lending right now. The market's open, especially for the small business owner. They really are. Uh, I mean, it's been a, a long time now, it seems, that uh, things that had crashed and banks were really you know, holding back um, because of their own internal problems with non-performing loans, with uh, the increased regulations and that type of thing. And certainly the increased regulations and compliance continue to be a cloud over small business, medium-sized banking. Right. Banks want to lend. Interest rates are very low. When interest rates are very low, banks have difficulty in making money because a large part of their, what they make money off of. Sure, their income. It, well, they have they have equity, mm -hmm. okay, which is a, on a daily basis, no cost. They're not paying any interest on it, and they have deposits, which they are paying interest on it. Mm -hmm. You read bank financial statements; they talk about their interest rate spread. Mm -hmm. So, if they're paying one percent, let's say on savings accounts, and if they lend at uh, three and a half, four four and a half percent, which is kind of common these days, they're making a spread of you know three 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 and a half percent. Doesn't sound too bad. But on the equity side, let's say they have a hundred million dollars of equity. When interest rates are generating uh, overnight funds, let's say half a percent, they're making, what's that, $50,000? Right. When interest rates are 6%, mm. yeah. they're making $300,000 yeah. on the same equ equity base. Right. So that's why banks like to have higher interest rates, um, not too high because that sort of curtails business activity in general. But that's, that's one of the problems. So banks do want to lend money. Uh, they want to increase their the loan portfolios. Um, they're aggressively seeking a new business in terms of them uh, uh, reducing their standards, though. That's another issue right. because of the regulatory issues, the compliance issues, and just plain you know prudence. So there's still probably uh, plenty of small and medium-sized businesses that will say, I can't get the kind of financing I, I really need on the one side, and the bank's saying, boy, we're, we're hiring you know, business development people and opening uh, uh, lending offices and that type of thing, trying to get out to the public to make more loans, but they're not making as, as many loans as we'd like to. Is it as easy for a small business to get a loan from a large bank as it is from a medium-sized bank? Well, it depends what size of loan. For example, uh, just to be, uh, be, uh, use a generality, if it's $100,000 or less, they're very much handled as if they were almost personal loans. Mm -hmm. Even the, uh, the Small Business Administration, their guaranteed loan programs, they have what they call an express loan. Mm -hmm. 
which is $100,000, unless it's like a two-page application, mm -hmm. very quick approval process. Wow, okay. Yeah, and, and, and business owners have to sign personally, of course. Right. And then you know, they look at the credit scores and, and that type of thing. With larger loans, a few hundred thousand dollars to millions, it's, um, it, it depends. Uh, larger banks, I guess, typically have a reputation of more bureaucracy, more layers of authority where the loan gets approved and that type of thing. Smaller banks have the, at least the ability to be more nimble um, I'm visiting a uh, bank um, actually on, on Friday that has $2 million in assets. They have two branches. One branch is where their headquarters is, and another branch is about 50 miles away or 30 miles away. So in that branch, in that bank, they have, I'll say, the commercial lending officer. Next door in the office is going to be the chief lending officer, and next door to him is going to be the chief credit officer, wow. and then the president's next door to that. Right. So they can really, almost really walk, walk, through walk it through. It, right? yeah, and absolutely. that's, that's going to be. Uh, uh, pretty quick. So that's a generality, but um, in large part, it, it holds true. So we're both in fields of consolidation, right? Oh, Banks boy. Are consolidating. And part of it is, as you pointed out, the compliance, the yes, cost of cybersecurity. All yes. of these are adding tremendous costs and size matters. Sure. So, you know, being able to have enough critical mass to spread those expenses. But where do you see this ending it's anytime soon, or are we going to well, end up with three large banks? Well, uh, maybe three or four large banks, and, but still a lot of, I think, very local, smaller banks, the $200 million bank, the $500, $500 million bank. Right. You know, here in Philadelphia, you know, we're, we're a big city, we're a big metropolitan area. That doesn't represent uh, you know, the United States, really. Right. I mean, think about the rest of Pennsylvania. Yeah. All those towns, most of them still have local banks. If it's a big town, maybe it's going to have a branch of a large bank. Alabama in between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia? <laughs> <laughs> Almost something like that. Yeah. But... Um, the regional banks, uh, I'd say banks with uh, perhaps $10 billion in, uh, in, and over, right. their targets for the $100 billion bank or the $300 uh, billion bank, and an awful lot of that's happening. Um, and even on the smaller side, a, uh, a $2 billion bank is buying a $200 million bank. Mm -hmm. And as they creep up, they get larger to into that $10, million, $10 billion range, right. they're probably going to be a target for some acquisition and for a sale and for the stockholders to make a lot of money. Sure. But the compliance issue is, uh, uh, here's a little story. There was a uh, bank I was familiar with, um, had about a billion dollars in assets, and uh, I guess eight years ago they had one compliance officer. Now they have six. Mm -hmm. So they're paying five people, maybe a total of I don't know, $500,000 more for, for what? For nothing. Right. The bank's not, whether it's bigger or smaller or doing something or doing something else, they've got half a million dollars more in expenses. So I sit on the board of a couple of public companies and I have had a lot of experience. Though I will tell you, I think that some of the compliance requirements that we have placed on both businesses have at its core a, a good solid reason. I just think that, like with anything else, the bureaucracy that can grow from Overreaction. that. Overreaction, yes. So that you, you really at some time sit back and say, I don't understand why we're going in this direction. I do think that the cyber security and the cost mm -hmm. of the cyber issues are real. And that one, I think, will eventually cause, like in my industry, there is a lot of consolidation as well. Um, that doesn't really impact a firm that is a boutique firm like us, where we are, our firm is really focused on being the, the really trusted advisor for the very wealthy, large mm -hmm. families and individuals and businesses who really want that personalized service. But to some degree, it does impact it because they're able, by consolidating their resources, still have the same cybersecurity and all the compliance mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. that I must have, but yes. I can do it with you know 70 people, 60 professionals in the city. They can do it with six to 700 at each location, yeah. right? Uh, so yeah. it's a, the scale is different, though. There are other issues yeah. there, but there are, the scale is different. Well, the cybersecurity is, is an interesting concept to it. At smaller banks, and I've worked at both large, very large banks and, uh, and very small banks, the smaller banks typically are not going to develop their own in-house proprietary cybersecurity system and have um, you know, a whole team of you know, 12 uh, cybersecurity experts or something. They're typically going to outsource it with mm -hmm. a consulting company sure. that specializes in that and probably services right. 50, 100, 100 banks, smaller right. banks. So they do have sophisticated systems. But here's a story. I, I once uh, was asked, in fact, uh, it was on this, this show uh, a couple of years ago. The question uh, was about, um, so I'm an individual and have an account at a bank, and uh, something happens with my, my, my account is hacked. Who is responsible? 
And you think, well, the bank said, well, you know, if you'd loan notify, notify us in time, you know, on the credit card thing or something like that, you know, um, we'll refund you the money or something like that. But um, I went to a, the, one of the cybersecurity people at the, mm -hmm. the local bank and I asked them that question. And they kind of like, well, you know, it really comes down to the consumer's responsibility. If you read f our fine print, right. mm. it says that. Ultimately, yeah. you're going to be held responsible. Mm. Mm. So it's, it, was, it was very interesting. And I noticed that on their website, they, they put a lot more information about read the government regulations, how so cybersecurity works. So I know works. like with Target and a few, and Home Depot and a few of the others where there were breaches, there were actually were fees that they needed to pay back to the banks for the fact that they did not have the security, so they didn't have the chip reader, they had the mm -hmm. swipe. Mm -hmm. And you know what their role and responsibility was, even though the banks looked like they covered everyone's charges, yeah, right? Yeah. Everything was reversed and you didn't have to um, pay for that. It really, the cost was the company who had the breach had to pay for that to each one of them. So yeah, I think yeah. you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. People yeah. just ha have to keep asking, how right. does it work? Right. And you know, give me an example type of thing. Right. It's a continuing, yeah. uh, you know, issue, you know, problem and, and that type of thing. Uh, so do you have a question for me? Usually they have uh, a write-in question? Yes, we ask, yes, we do. We have a question from... Oh, there you go. Let's see. Did I have it down here? Well, it was a, it was a tax question. It was, um, it, it was from an individual. Okay. And the question was, um, what can I do to um, reduce my taxes? What are new things, c you know, coming into play that I should be aware of? So, you know, sometimes the best thing you can do in order to control your tax liability from an individual standpoint is just keep good records. It's just amazing to me, even today with the ability to have things more automated, how many people will still not keep track of expenses that they're entitled to mm -hmm. or keep track of the records that are required. Charitable donations, the IRS says that anything over $250 needs to have a letter from the charity but they're very specific about what that letter says. That letter should say not only how much you gave and thank you very much for giving it, mm -hmm. but it must state specifically that either no goods or services were received in exchange for mm -hmm. this gift or how much those goods and services were. So if you went to a dinner and you paid $500 for the seat and they tell you later that the dinner was $75 right. and therefore you have a $425 donation. So many people will not keep those letters and when it's mm. over 250, and sometimes there are large numbers that are over mm. 250, it is amazing. The IRS will just disallow it. The yeah. IRS will say it's not in compliance with their rules. Well, here's a very common thing I see and hear all the time. All these uh, charities that are asking for you to donate your car, mm -hmm. your used boat, mm -hmm. uh, you know, w whatever, uh, and they provide a, a form. Right, but they provide the appraisal and the, the reputable um, institution. So the Salvation Armies, mm -hmm. and they, they know how to do it. They've made this into a process. Mm -hmm. um, they do want your car. They have an appraisal. That appraisal gets attached okay. to your tax return. Um, I think it's sometimes when people try to cut a corner that you can get into trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I also think that some of, the, um, some of the tax planning that can be done is often done at the business level or the investment level, and then that flows down into the individual level. Mm -hmm. So that sometimes people are thinking of their accountants as tax preparers. And we don't think of ourselves as tax preparers. We think of ourselves as tax advisors. I want to mm. know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And as you're telling me what you're doing, I'm thinking, OK, so you said you're in between banks. So I'm thinking job hunting costs mm -hmm. that are deductible. I'm right. thinking whether or not you've been a consultant. If you're a consultant, maybe you've received some consulting income. It's a Form mm -hmm. 1099 income. Should you form a, 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 a self-employed retirement plan should mm -hmm. you maybe even if it's larger kind of consulting consider a defined benefit mm -hmm. plan have you looked at what expenses you know just different things like that so i think again to be thinking in tax advisory th mm -hmm. format not just about tax prep and to be very well organized are two things you can do that will reduce taxes. just one corollary question so how should i keep my tax records i mean the, the shoe box with all the pieces of paper is one Please thing now and then I read about all these uh, scanners and filing systems and on the cloud and that type of so thing. So I think, you know, um, I think that's right. I think we're moving into the world where, you know, electronic record keeping is much safer um, in many respects mm -hmm. than just paper files. And you can purge them much easier. So at the end of six years, you can, you can mm -hmm. purge those files. You can save the files that you need to save, like... Mm -hmm for, you know, until you get rid of an asset, like the purchase of your home or the purchase of a car. So I am a big supporter of that.
Mm. Yeah, we did have a question from, from a viewer, and I just wanted to uh, add that uh, if you have a question, that uh, you can send that question to Money Matters TV, the following uh, address. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matters-tv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S, tv.com. Our featured guest today is Mickey McLaughlin of Ugo Stations. How are you today, Paul? Mickey, I'm terrific. Good to meet you. Thanks for coming to the show. Yeah, sure. It's good stuff. You've got an interesting uh, business. Um, Ugo Stations doesn't tell me a heck of a lot. Uh, Maybe you can fill me in. Sure. Um, I started a company in 08. It was called South Jersey Green. And then I went to Oak Energy Partners, and then I ran into a gentleman named Norman Zarwin in Philadelphia. Sure, attorney, I think. Attorney, Zarwin Bond, and um, Mitchell Kaplan, and uh, Ted Schotty, and Joe T- uh, Scher. But make a long story short, I saw Norman, we were having a pig rose up at the University of Penn. Nice. And I was sponsoring it uh, with Clean Cities, and uh, Norman came up to me and he said, I want to get involved with you. I said, uh oh. Because you like the pig, or what? Well, he liked that, but he also, um, I. I was in the charging station business for the electric cars. Okay. That's what Yugo is today. Uh, we have a business. We're in 32 different states. Wow. We got 45 chargers in the ground. We're sponsored by Nissan North America. Uh-huh. Um, with BMW. I'm with the i3s. I'm with the Teslas. I'm with the Mercedes-Benz uh-huh. people. Um, what's happening in the future with the electric cars, like we all know, I mean, in, they say in 2025 it'll be zero emissions. It's amazing. Zero. Wow. It's Mickey, are you the manufacturer or are you the no. distributor? We're, we're, or uh, we work for a company called ABB and another thing called the EV Box. Okay. ABB is a level three chargers. They're the fast chargers. Uh, you can charge your vehicle in 15 minutes, 80%. The level two charger, where you're going to see in mostly all your residentials, uh, that's a four and a half hour charge, 220 to 240. But that's going to be at home. So when you're at home, so you know you can also plug into 110 outlets, but that's a 19-hour charge. Yeah. Okay. So who are your customers for you go? Uh, universities like Penn State's putting lots of chargers in today. Princeton shopping malls, they're the four-hour charge. And, you know, you and you're the installer. That's you, right. You We're the installer. We own and operate them. We okay. put them in. Okay. Okay. And uh, over and they're the leased to the owners. Well, we give them a revenue. It's kind of like the the phone booth. Remember when you used to go and put the phone booth in? You give them a yeah. percentage. Or the ATM now, the ATM machine. ATM is the exact same kind of model. That's how we okay. started. I hired a guy named Bill Pedicosto. He lives in Travis City, Michigan. He's the CEO. There's another gentleman named David Sowens. His father was Bill Sowens. He's a good friend of mine. I met Bill first, and then I met David. Mm-hmm. David's my partner and co-founder. Then we hired another guy named John O'Sullivan. He's an electrical engineer. He does all of our installations with Local 98. And uh, NECA, do you have guys ever hear of NECA? Yeah. There's 4,000 electric contractors around America. Yeah. They're in safety and codes. Okay. And that was very important mm-hmm. to me in the beginning because they have to have a million dollar policy to put the chargers in the ground, yeah. the mm-hmm. electricians. It's all about safety. You know, people say they are electric. And when you stand in a puddle, do you get, yeah, right. you know, right. there's juice coming out of these things. Now, once it's disengaged, everything's off. Mm-hmm. Right. The first charger in Philadelphia was at 1600 Columbus Avenue. Norman Zarin owns. Liberty Gas Station down there. Right. That was the okay. first charger in Philadelphia, wow. Wow. level two. So I live in a neighborhood of Philadelphia, mm-hmm. and I see some parking spots chargers. Mm-hmm. Parking uh, reserved only for electric cars. That's so correct. So the person outside in, lives in that house. That's correct. Like it's got that space reserved for them. That's correct. And they have a charger there. That's correct. It's almost like a handicapped spot today. Yeah. yeah. If you have an electric car, you can put a sign outside your house, South Philadelphia, mm-hmm. Northern so Liberty. <laughs> so how can you? How do? How does an individual purchase a charging station? They could actually do that as well. Sure. Sure. You can put them in their homes. Like the the future ones with the ZV box we're talking about. It's going to be like an easy card, easy pass card. I have right. one in my pocket here. Right. And and you can go up and go across it. There's no money involved. It's all about the internet today. And Tesla has, there's VIN numbers on top of the chargers. You punch in the VIN number, and then you put your Mergen Express into but the But how park. will you do it at your home? Uh, it, it just goes right onto your electric bill. 
And, it, and it's peanuts. It, it's like an outlet for a light. Right. It's like these lights. Right so here. you just LED. charge it into your regular outlet? The, yes, correct. In the 110 or 220 or 240. It. Okay. Well, you're going to have a wire going through the outside your house underground or? Well, yeah. It's well, that I understand. Yeah. But in your house, you're just basically going, I mean, I know this sounds no. so, I, you <laughs> know what I'm thinking <laughs> of? I'm thinking of that commercial saying, what's the internet, right? That yeah. the, you know, the morning show did and they mm -hmm. ran it 30 years later and said, look at them. They're yeah. asking, what's the internet? I think this yeah. is going to be our show. Amazing story. It is going to happen. I mean, it, it, yeah. I'm 61 years old. Like we were talking earlier, the five-year-old. You say to them, uh, they've been in cars, electric cars. Mm -hmm. They're going to plug in. Right. And I'm, I mean, in 40, 50 years from now, I won't be here probably, but that little kid will be here and they'll be driving an electric car. So what, here's my question then. Uh, mm -hmm. Most electricity now is produced by, I guess, oil still or, right. or whatever. So it's going to be electric. So it's still going to be a, a, a footprint of consuming energy. But it's going to be electric energy, so it may be produced by oil or may be produced by... Nuclear, nuclear or, right, right. Or, or something else. There's a program in Philadelphia, PE is going through, it's called Vehicle to Grid, V to G. And V to G is the University of Delaware, University of Michigan, uh, Penn State's involved. There's a new technology coming. And I, and I can't answer some of those questions because I don't know the new technology. It's kind of like, you remember when we first started with our, our phones were large. Right. Yeah, right. in suitcases. That's right. Now they're... <laughs> Now they're here, and Tesla's building a car right now. The battery technology, it's not going to be a lithium battery. It's going to be something new. Mm. But that's still three years away. But in 10 years from now, I mean, you'd be lucky if you see gasoline cars. So you've been in business for doing this for, what, five, 10 years? We've been in business eight years. Eight years. So let's take, go back and take a look mm. at your business plan five years ago. Oh. How's the growth been compared to what that it's business plan predicted? It's, uh, well, the cars, when we first started, they, I used to knock on doors to get money. Mm -hmm. And people said, Mickey, that's, yeah. that's really far out. I mean, right. you're, you're talking, the cars weren't here. Mm -hmm. uh, the first car we really was was a Chevy Volt, the mm -hmm. Nissan Leafs. The Leaf mm -hmm. is a beautiful car. Mm -hmm. And people go to me all the time, they go, are they quick? They're faster than quick. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Tesla, I mean, the clock's at 190 miles an hour, mm -hmm. which we can't go that fast. <laughs> you know, all the police cars in New York City, Manhattan, are Chevy Volts. Really? A lot of them are. Mm -hmm. Wow. The BMWs, the i3s, and the i8s are mm -hmm. consumer cars. That I, we were talking earlier, most people only drive 15 miles, maybe 20 miles a day. Even, and that's the real factor is, if the one, like the Chevy Bolt is coming out 2017. I saw it on CNN yesterday. 238 miles to the charge. You can drive from D.C. to New York on yep. one charge. What will be the driving force for the consumer to choose the electric car over the gas car? Well, the, hybrid, the hybrid. Hybrid. Well, the hybrid electric car. Well, but I mean, why would they choose e to have a hybrid? I mean, gas prices are well, coming down. Is it only that you need to have gas prices go up it, for no. someone to change their behavior? But why yes. would I go out tomorrow and buy an electric car and not continue to buy Saving a the gas earth? How's car? that sound Pardon me? Saving the earth? Well, the saving the, the earth is huggers. a good reason. Yeah, I'm right. trying to add, you know, that's but right. it still has a footprint, but no, you're no, saying right. not as large? Yeah, you know, I, I can't predict that. I can't predict the glass jar, which I know is there. But, you know, I, I look at Norman Zarwin, which he told me when I first met Norman. He's a petroleum man. He told me, Mickey, if I would have met you 50 years ago, which you weren't in business yet, we would have been in the electric car business. Hmm. Here's a man that's knowledge. I mean, very large knowledge. Mm -hmm. So what's your competition? What, uh, who else is, is doing this? Uh, how do they do it differently? Tesla's uh, doing it. They give a, Tesla has their own network. Okay. If you own a Tesla, you can plug into their stations for free. But that's all changed and just recently, ways you should measure people, to tax people. They're going to be getting involved with that. There's another company. Tax people. There you go. There's there yeah. another, yeah. another line of business for you. They're a little different. We're <laughs> tax, but very different but tax. Different, but it's, Not it's income tax. But there's a model coming at you that you will be learning about. The Charge Point America, it's called, it used to be called Coulomb, C-O-U-L-O-U-M-B. That's how I got in the business. They're out there. Um, Schneider Electric is out there. Um, Hugo is out there. There's not a lot of companies that are really doing the charging station. The way I look at it is a McDonald's here and there's a Burger King. There's right. McDonald's, there's a Burger King. Someday, there will be everywhere, mm -hmm. every doorstep. You mentioned you have a bunch of partners, like, like AAA. Mm -hmm. so, so what does that mean? How, how does that partnership work? Well, AAA is on their own right now, but they are also carrying charging uh, stations on the back of their truck. So when you run out of juice, they're going to give you a jolt so you get home. 
near me will plug in there. Instead of a whole new battery. Right, like Dunkin' that. Donuts is involved with this. Uh, Wyndham Worldwide so, so is involved So that means that they're putting this. chargers in their Not restaurant their locations? That's correct. Okay. Does it change how manufacturers will make cars? Yes, eventually. Uh, right now there's two plugs. There's the Chatamo plug, which is a big plug. That goes in the Leaf, that goes into the Mercedes-Benz. Tesla charges the J1772 plug. It's a smaller plug, and that's a standard for all of them. But everything else, as far as the battery, the carburetor, the, is all of that staying the same? It's not there. There's no carburetor. There's no carburetor. The way there's to those Sure, because it doesn't no, need to be There's there, no right? oil I'm changes. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. There's the way no engines. I sat so on the, the board the of Pep Boys. I still don't understand how cars run. Here's a good example. Go I was talking to Bridgestone and Firestone the other day, and I'm, I'm trying to get them to come in for the level two chargers. That's a four-hour charge, four and a half, basically. But on a Polita charge, th most people are going to get it back to their homes. You know, they, they have to space to where they are right now. There are apps, and you can see where they all are in Philadelphia. You know, PlugShare, uh, ChargePoint has another little app. But what is happening, the vision of the person that wants, like when the gas prices were, we thought we were going to be in trouble a couple years ago. Man, when they were up here, they wrote oh, scary. To $5 a gallon, scary, right? scary, yeah. I mean, right now it's two thirty nine yeah. nine or something like that. South Jersey, it's one ninety seven. Yeah. But will it stay there? Yeah. Nobody knows. I mean, the oil price, what happens in the Middle East, gas prices, oil. Mm -hmm. if, but if I have an electric car, I'm not worried about that. So the electric car engine is different from the yeah. gasoline engine. That's so it, is it a lot lighter? So does it oh, make the whole here. car a lot, a oh, lot yeah. lighter? Oh, yeah. The Teslas Which are light. They're, they're very light cars. So that by itself will save you energy consumption. Right. Right. Fascinating. I mean, Absolutely you fascinating. you all approve? Uh, I'm very fortunate I've been in it. I was in the golf business for 35 years. Mm. I saw something coming back in 205. And that's how I got into this. And, and I meet all kinds of great people. Mm -hmm. right. So what kind of financing do you get these days? Right now it's all friends and family money. Okay. Uh, we, are, we do look for investors. Uh, mm -hmm. The return on the investment is a little bit still pretty and a half, five years out. Mm -hmm. Why would you put money into a, a charging station business if you can put it in a nice stock market somewhere? But well, I'm thinking of venture capital or private equity oh, no, investments. No, I've been down that door a Consolidation, long time. Consolidation, you know, yeah. a growing business, um, you know. Yeah. We're always looking for investors um, to talk. You can talk to Bill Petacasso and David Sowens. Mm -hmm. They're my guys and John Savchek. We have a nice model uh, mm -hmm. that does work. The next hit's going to be the level two, the EV box. Residential, they're going to have them everywhere in America. They're predicting uh, they come from the Netherlands. This company, the EV mm -hmm. Box, they're predicting uh, fifty thousand were sold in the, in the Netherlands. Wow! I could do that in New Jersey. Yeah. I mean, residential. Yeah. Every yeah. new home you see in the future, uh -huh. every new home is going to have an EV. In so, it. so, how much does it cost in Sloan? Ah, it's peanuts, thirty-three hundred. Okay. Yeah, and then you have it. Well, that's fascinating. So we had to get together and form some kind of finance company. We're going to have to talk things. after this. <laughs> yeah. right. Thank you. I, I appreciate your time very much. Thank you uh, for thanks coming. Thanks for inviting me. Thank it's great. Well, it's, a great it's, it's, a, it's a great story. A little bit of uh, story yeah. of the, the future. I like I like uh, that. And then you've got something going right, right now. We'll yeah. right. We had a show uh, a while ago about uh, drones. Oh yeah. I'm and you know, an, an infancy uh, kind of industry. I'm involved with the drones. You're in drones too. Mm -hmm. Well, you are. That's another show. Well, Mickey, terrific. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you very much. It's great. Thank you. We, um, that concludes our, our show now, but uh, I just want to let you know that our, our next guest will be Ken Miller, Esquire of Kraut Harris PC. Thank you, and have a good evening, and remember that your money matters. Mm -hmm.